Hello. Welcome you to worship here at Zion Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Dan Schultz, or just P. Dan, for those of you who know me well. Thank you, Bryce, for that Bach piece as a prelude. I had a college teacher, music teacher, that said you can't go wrong if you start with Bach. So thank you again for that wonderful piece. Many things going on. Maybe the first and foremost is we're celebrating Pentecost. The last several weeks, you've seen us in white vestments and white here on the cross. Now we are in the season of Easter still, but also celebrating the Feast of Pentecost. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Pastor Neil will also discuss some of those things, being in two places at once. A uh, very, uh, very wonderful thing still happening in Zion's congregation. Uh, my children's message today, I'll talk about how children's ministry kind of wrapped up their year-long time together with the kids and the teachers, even though it was COVID distance at the end, a lot of wonderful things. So we'll be celebrating the end of their time together today as well. We still have a lot of people out there that are in need of things and a lot of people out there that are saying, hey, I've got some extra, whatever the case may be. So please let us know if you are in need or if you have something that maybe you've used to someone around here, let Pastor Neil or myself know and we can be that, as he says, the intermediary to get those pieces to the people that need them the most. Uh, another important thing coming up here, of course, is 2020 graduation time. So whether it's a college or university or whether it's a, a senior high school, we want to be able to celebrate those graduates. Not sure exactly what it's going to look like at this point, but we are going to recognize them. We are going to do a blanket blessing of some sort for our high school graduates. We've got a number of them, and we look forward to being able to do that at some point in the near future. Stay tuned for more news on that. With that, I think we will get started. On this day we celebrate Pentecost, we make our beginning in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. As Pastor Dan mentioned, uh, for 50 days, Especially 50 days ago, we celebrated Easter. Hard to believe how that started uh, our activities here online and the other ministry things that we're doing. But today, on that 50th great celebration day, the Lord poured out in a dramatic way the Holy Spirit. So you'll note in our confession and absolution the reference to Easter, but also the tie-in with Pentecost, as Pastor Schultz will be sharing with us in his message in a little bit. Join me in our confession. This joyful Easter tide away with sin and sorrow, my love the crucified has sprung to life this morrow. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed, alleluia. Even as we glory in the gift of eternal life, in that hope we spend our days in joyful repentance and faith. Let us confess our sin that sin that still so easily besets us, and receive the full forgiveness our Lord daily provides for us. Had Christ, who once was slain, not burst his three-day prison, our faith has been in vain. But now has Christ arisen, 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 but now has Christ arisen. We are your baptized people. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us into our Easter joy. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in the first of our Pentecost hymns, hymn number 497, Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord.
Let us pray. O oh God, on this day you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day, by the same Spirit, to have a right understanding in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our three lessons that are assigned for this special Pentecost weekend are all focusing on that idea of the third person of the Trinity, the impact that he's had on each of us, the creating a faith, sustaining a faith through a variety of means. So as you listen to these lessons this morning, hear that thread already from the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, through the story of the first Pentecost and Acts, and then that wonderful gospel message of reassurance that we have through Jesus. Our first reading is from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 through 30. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing so. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that my Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. This is the Old Testament word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then moving ahead several thousand years, we come to the book of Acts. Acts, A-C-T-S, meaning the history, the acts of those early Christians and what they did. And this is always known as the birthday of the Christian church. From Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own languages, tongues, the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked, said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea! And all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And then our gospel from that of John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to give a special ear of attention to Pastor Dan. He's got a special message, as he mentioned in the beginning. He's got a special little treat here concerning your children and the Sunday school. So kids, especially you, but you older kids of all ages, take note as well. As Pastor Neil said, we have a children's message today, and I don't think we've had a children's message in this distance format since Easter. I think that was probably the last time with the Flamingo video. Uh, so we're glad that we're able to not only do this social distance, uh, virtual church as it were, for the adults, but we also want to include some time for the kids. Now, our normal Sunday school time would finish up before Memorial Day. This year, due to some technical issues with our software that we've been using for the last couple of months, we ended up having to do our final Sunday with the kids on Memorial Day weekend. It worked out just fine. Some of you were up at the cabin, up at the lake, and you were still able to join us, so we were so happy there. So I want to show you just a couple of slides that kind of cap off the end of our Sunday school year. I'll show you this very first slide. Zion's Jesus and Me, I think also called Backpacks for Jesus, but if you can see, it might be kind of hard to see, we've got several of the little ones. This is uh, kindergarten through grade five. Several of the little ones with their little Jesus uh, stuffed plushie and doing different things and writing special notes about how Jesus is with them each and every day. Go on to the next slide. Of course, we can't forget the Zion Christmas Festival. This year we had the drums. We do something different every year, it seems, and it just gets better and better and becomes a wonderful highlight of the Christmas season. Had a bit smaller group this year, but still we had an enjoyable time. Jesus' message was shared. The light of the world is coming was the theme. And we have all sorts of pictures here that I'll probably put out on the website or on the YouTube channel so you can see them just a little bit better. But to celebrate other things that we have done during this year, not just related to COVID. We've done a whole lot of things through the last nine months. So our Christmas festival was one of those. Moving on, we did a movie night when we could still get together and come together in that form. And we had several pictures here of the celebration of movie night. Usually we have a picture of Pastor Dan kind of snoozing or just laying with his, his arms behind his head, but I think they got rid of those pictures. So thank you for getting rid of those. So that was Zion's movie night, uh, late February, I believe that was. And then we move on. And we had class fun, again, hearkening back to the months before COVID-19, when we can actually be in the classrooms here at Zion. So if these rooms don't look familiar to you, it's because you haven't been here for a while. But we did do all sorts of wonderful things, shared the message of Jesus' love to the kids, helped those kids understand that it's important that we share that message of love out to our family out to our friends and the people that we come in contact with. And hopefully you and I as adults are modeling that for our kids as well, all year long, not just in our Pentecost focus. So I think we have one more slide. 
Zion moves online. And this is a big undertaking. Some of you maybe have taken part of that in your church or in your business, being able to move everything to home, to be able to distance, to be able to do these things online with Zoom or whatever your platform might be. So you understand, some of you, the difficulty and the wonderful work that our technical people had to do to pull this all together. A special thanks to Pete Chase, our Board of Technology Chair, as well as Kevin Stripling and all the Sunday School students and all those who helped and assisted with this wonderful program. So there's several fun slides. Again, it's small, you won't be able to see it, but hopefully I'll be able to post that somewhere else. The Board of Children's Ministry, the next slide, they wanted to say thank you to all of the students and all of the teachers. They are able to say thank you usually uh, up here in the front of the sanctuary during one or multiple of our services towards the end of the year. But this time again, we had to do it COVID style. So uh, the Board of Children's Ministry got together, they put this uh, little slideshow together, and we're gonna share what they wanted to say directly to you parents, and especially you students who stuck with us through this trying time. So go to the next slide. The world is turned upside down, and it may seem unbearable and puzzling. We know you are working tirelessly to share the love of Jesus to the children whether in the classroom or in distance learning. Again, talking about all of those folks who were involved in being able to bring Jesus to the families at home or wherever they were joining us from. We know that the Good Shepherd takes care of his flock. You are part of Jesus' ministry and faithful servants sharing the gospel. Our days are full of grace because Jesus is our Savior, and that is the truth. And then the last slide, the Board of Children's Ministry wants to express our thankfulness to all of Zion's teachers who are among the first responders to Christ. And that's Corey Judge, Janelle Gates, Ruth Gabres, and Nancy Zuber. They wanted to say thank you. And I want to again say thank you to everyone who was involved in our children's ministry. A lot of volunteers, lots of hours, lots of time spent, not only for our Sunday school superintendents, Jess and Janet, but also all the other teachers who were with us and helping us all throughout the year. So I wanted to end the year on, with that kind of capstone project to be able to once again share with you there are wonderful ministries happening here at Zion. Even if you aren't able to attend them in person, we continue to do the things we do to reach out into the community, to be that place of hope, that beacon of hope here in Hopkins, and we hope you are doing that wherever you may be as well. Thank you. Now I invite you to join with us in our next hymn, number 501, Come Down, O Love Divine.
grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. When you Jesus' words from this short passage from John, there are a couple of things that struck me and are important for you. You see, Jesus promises that out of our innermost self, our being, our soul, he says this, rivers of living water will flow. Now, that to me sounds pretty awesome. And even if you aren't sure exactly what Jesus is talking about, it seems important. Definitely something you would want in your life. Jesus is saying, if you're in need, if you're feeling weak, if you've got stress, especially during this COVID time and now all of the protests and rioters and days worth of destruction of property, you just kind of wonder sometimes. Maybe you've got poor health. Maybe you've had a, a loss in your life. We've had a losses of people, a lot of them this week. Several members of Zion who have been faithful for years and other extended family members of Zion's. So we know that we are all dealing with uncertainty in this tough time. Jesus says, anyone who is thirsty can come to me. You got those tough things in your life? Come to me. If you lack anything, here is what I offer. I offer rivers of living water will flow from your heart. And then it's interesting, John parenthetically, literally with parentheses in many of the translations, shares with us what this living water can do. John adds this clarification. Now, when he, Jesus, said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. See, Pentecost hadn't happened yet. Jesus had not risen and ascended yet. So what Jesus' words, what he was speaking in the temple that day, was beyond and back from our story of Pentecost. It was in the past. But here Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit, the third person in our three-person Trinitarian God. And we followers of Jesus, we are promised all throughout the Old and New Testament that the work of the Holy Spirit will be in believers and a river of power and fulfillment to be there when we want help, when we're looking for answers. If you're needing anything, you have been promised a rushing river of help. But friends, if you're anything like me, that promised river often feels more like a trickle. And I've even gone through times in my own life, and you probably have too, where there are periods of drought, where the water seems all dried up. I didn't feel particularly powerful or fulfilled during those times. In fact, just the opposite. I felt powerless. I felt helpless at times. And where is the river then, when I need it the most? And what about you? Can you honestly say that you've always felt that abundant river of living water building up inside of you and flowing out of you? <laughs> A consistent flow of rushing water? No, I don't suspect any of us can say, yeah, Jesus' words nailed it. That's exactly how I would describe my life. Although there's some TV evangelists that would say, yeah, that's what I am 24 hours a day, and you can be too. Friends, that's not quite the case. Yeah, honesty would force me, and I'm guessing you would have to say instead that, well, actually there's been some times in my life where that river has been less than full. I have had some high water moments through my life, and I can name them off and I can think about them, but there's been a lot of times when I felt challenged, when I felt helpless, where I felt like I needed something more than what I could come up with myself. It'd be a stretch to describe my Christian life the way that Jesus describes it. But why is that? It's so clearly promised in the text before us and in other texts, like I said, throughout the Old and New Testaments. But I think the issue here is that so often people get caught up in the focus on that power or lack of power. 
and instead need to reflect on how Jesus promised that that power would come to his believers. To understand that, we need to go back to Jesus' first words in the prior verse. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. Yeah, here's the deal. And it's absolutely critical. It's true that the Holy Spirit lives inside of each and every believer. And what makes a believer a believer? Well, there's got to be a trust. There's got to be some faith. There's got to be a thirst for what Jesus has to offer us. There's got to be a desire for Jesus and only for Jesus, for everything in my life, for every need that I will ever have. So if I count myself as a believer, and I know the Spirit is at work in me because it's promised, if I'm not experiencing that living water, <laughs> where does the problem lie, do you suppose? <laughs> it lies in me. It lies with me and what I hold dear and what I focus on. Taking my eyes off of Jesus all, literally all the time to think I can do things on my own. So yeah, if I'm encountering a drought in my life, then Jesus' words should really convict me because my walk with him is obviously not where it needs to be. And there could be a whole range of reasons why my walk with Jesus is not matured to the point that I would want it to be. Why my spiritual life may feel a little dusty at times. Why I'm not experiencing a flood 100% of my time. And this lack in myself, so often it can lead me down to doubt, to despair, to guilt. Why aren't I receiving this, Heavenly Father? You promised there must be something wrong with me. I must be broken beyond repair. Friends, that is not the truth. Because Jesus' words give me hope. If my life doesn't match his description here, it can and so can yours. This is a promise from the Son of God for all to come to him and drink. To come to him and your thirst will be completely satisfied. But you have to note what Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say those riverbanks will always be constantly filled. Or that you're going to start out with more than just a trickle, more than maybe a garden's hose worth of a stream. But he does say we can look forward to that ideal, those rivers of power rushing in us as we make progress in our walk with him, in our trust in him. Now, those of us who are on that faith journey in life, we understand what St. Paul tells us, that our faith relationship has to start like that of an infant, where he kind of turns from the water metaphor and simile more towards the, the milk idea that we are infants. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I had to feed you, the new Christians in Corinth he's talking about here. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And Peter picks up this metaphor. He says, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. And friends, we can rely on Jesus. We can rely on that power growing in us as we mature in our connection with him. When we learn to call on him first, rather than trying to do it ourselves, and when that fails, then call on Jesus. No. No. Because we live in a, a tough world. It's a world of instant satisfaction. If something's hard, then it's probably not worth doing. If something's too hard for me, too challenging for me, I'm just going to give up. Because somebody will come along and bail me out. But that's not how faith and trust in Jesus work. That's not how our faith will mature, no. It's as we grow with Jesus that you and I get to experience that consistent fullness of joy. So friends, because of that truth, we should have hope. St. Paul says this, I am sure of this, that he, Jesus, who began a good work in you by sending the Spirit to us, will bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But friends, we have to work a little bit. It might be challenging. It will be challenging at times. But we do need to press on towards the goal. So here is Jesus' promise to all. Jesus Christ blesses all who believe in him with rivers of living water, living water of his spirit. So now we move to the second part of our discussion today and what this means for your life. What is implied by Jesus' promise and that these swelling banks of rivers are going to be here for you when you need them? but also the fact that those rivers of living water are not primarily for me and my life, but to be able to go through me and out to others so that I can bless others as well. And that is our Pentecost focus. I said at the beginning that we are not only in this time of Easter, these weeks beyond Easter, but today is a special time of focus on the spirits that are within us and the spirit that allows us to share what we know about Jesus to bless others. But to appreciate Jesus' claim here, we need to investigate the context of our reading. There's only those three very short verses. But we know that this took place, what Jesus said during the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, also called Sukho. And this is one of the seven important feasts in the Jewish calendar. And to commemorate this feast, the Israelites would build little booths, little tents or little shacks of some sort to remind them of how God cared for them when they were in the 40 years of wilderness, when he provided manna and quail and water from the rock. This feast looks forward to that final harvest and gathering of all the nations during the Messiah's coming kingdom, Judgment Day being the beginning of that kingdom. During Jesus' time, this feast would include a daily procession led by a priest carrying a golden pitcher of water drawn from the pool of Siloam. And this water was taken and it was poured out at the base of the temple altar. At the same time, a priest on the other side of the altar was pouring out a pitcher of wine. Now these things were pointing to the future outpouring of the Holy Spirit as predicted by Isaiah the prophet when he said in Isaiah chapter 12, with joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. In Isaiah 44, for I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields and I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. So at the climax of this multi-day feast, Jesus, on the last day of the festival, he makes this claim regarding the water symbolized in their procession. And John wants us to see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. In John chapter 1, verse 14, he told us literally, the word became flesh and dwelled or tabernacled among us. Paul goes on later to tell us in his first letter to the Corinthians, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus also uses other metaphors and symbols, talking about himself as the bread of life, the fulfillment of the manna that sustained Israel in the wilderness. When he said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So John here gives us a glimpse of Jesus on the final day of the feast, claiming to be those sources of living water to all who will come to him and drink. In other words, he's saying, I am fulfilling all that this feast symbolizes. I am the one who will come back at the end of all time and gather my believers to me. Now, this water-pouring ceremony took place every day for seven days, followed by an eighth day when a holy assembly was held near the temple. John said that during this time, Jesus stood and shouted in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And friends, what an astonishing claim. No mere human could make such a promise. Come to me 
and drink and I'll fulfill the scripture that we're celebrating today. I'll cause rivers of living water to flow out of your innermost being. Jesus knows us at our core, at our soul, at our innermost being. He knows what we need. And when we're feeling down and hurt and distressed and guilty. And who is it except God in human flesh? Jesus himself tabernacling, dwelling with us. Who else could legitimately make such a claim? Next, you have to see who Jesus is inviting. Who is he telling to come to him? Well, he says, anyone. Anyone who is thirsty. Now, anyone is about as broad as you can get in our English language. It even extended to Jesus' enemies, our enemies. The same enemies that were trying to kill Jesus those last time that he came to Jerusalem. Even they could come to Jesus and drink. The thief on the cross was pulled into this promise. And it later extended to a man who described himself as the chief of sinners, St. Paul. And by giving himself as an offering in this temple at the end of the feast, what was he saying? He was saying to all of you who are here, all who have come to Jerusalem from all over the place to celebrate this feast and this ritual, You are invited to come to me as well. Even though they were there to go through the prescribed Jewish rituals, Jesus is saying, these rituals aren't going to help you. I am your true help, your true comfort. Religious observances, while they're wonderful and we want to do them for the community they lend, for a chance to pray to God, to converse with him, to give him praise for all he gives us, religious observances cannot save anyone then or now. Everyone needs to come and take that personal invitation from Jesus and drink. And now, we're going to hear the best news. Because the Spirit inspired John to record Jesus' words here, the offer extends not only to those who were with Jesus that day, but to all of us who follow and believe in him now and to Judgment Day. Yeah, whether you grew up in a Christian home and went to church every day, or whether you've made a whole bunch of mistakes in your life, whether you're a convicted criminal, this offer is for you. Those bad actors that seem to be more intended lately that not to protest the death of George Floyd, Those ones who all they want to do is attack and kill and destroy and bring down structures and hold up traffic and disregard public safety and civil obedience. Even they are invited by Jesus. Come to me and I can share with you something better than anything you will experience here on the earth. Something better than what you're involved in here. Come to Jesus and drink. No one is excluded from this promise. And to underscore this truth, you jump to the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, and it's literally repeated. The promise is repeated there. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And he says, anyone. Come, come to me. Come and follow me. Learn more about me. Learn what you can accomplish in and through me. The special plans that I have for your life. All of those things. Jesus the Christ. His name, Jesus. His title, Christ or Messiah or Chosen One. Jesus blesses all who come to him with rivers of living water so that we will be satisfied and so that we can become a blessing to others in our life. We don't just have the gifts of the Spirit for ourselves. Now, it was never God's intention that we were here to walk through life alone. He never suggested that we need to figure it all out by ourselves. No, we're in community with each other. Even when we think we're alone, like Elijah hiding in the cave and fed by ravens, what did God say to him? No, no, Elijah, you're not really alone. 
I have reserved 7,000 good men who don't bow down to foreign gods and kings. You're not alone. And friends, none of you are alone either, even if it seems like it. You are still connected by what we are doing here. This worship is real worship. You are in a community of faith, praising God, thanking him, and considering all those other folks who are watching with you. A community is what allows us to receive and share all of our individual and unique traits in order to strengthen the whole Christian church. And we are still a church, even in the midst of a global pandemic. We still are a body of believers. You, who are connected by a common hope and common task. That doesn't just stop because we're suddenly separated by distance. Our community doesn't fail because of a crisis. Often, it draws us closer together. Our community doesn't fail because of a death. And we've had a lot of those. Not only George Floyd but many other members of our community of believers. And Pastor Neil will pray for many of those families in a little while. Nothing will stop Jesus' plan for us. No. The gift of Pentecost in our modern-day church is really at the core of every purpose that we have to share and spread the gospel. Notice that our mission statement here at Zion is not, let's keep all the belief and all the faith and all the trust inside these doors, not spread it out to anyone because then we can be safe and secure in our own little place. No, that's never the commitment to the church that Jesus asked us to make. Do you realize the season of Pentecost is the longest of our yearly church seasons? It runs from now all the way to Advent. Literally, half of each calendar year is our focus and emphasis on Pentecost, the life and mission of the church. So it certainly seems that it is our individual duty to grow in our own walk with Jesus so that we can bless others. The rivers will flow out of us who are thirsty. And friends, the world often looks like a barren desert when you see what's going on out there. Leaders at all levels doing things, anything else but helping people. Leaders in communities doing special things, but then they're overridden by the ones that want to attack and destroy, and that's all they want to do. There is a, a barren desert out there that you and I need to reach. Well, what can I do, Pastor Dan? You can do a lot. You can do a lot. I'll be sharing more of that later with a special devotion in a few days. But you and I are to be those rivers of living water that this dying world needs. And as those folks see Christ and the fruits of the Spirit and they want what we have, we can tell them how to get it. We can tell them, simply come to Jesus and drink. Lost people desperately need what only we as a believer can give them. And those rivers should flow out from us to other believers, not kept inside. Especially those folks who are going through such a dry spell right now, at home, alone, during this time of quarantine. Mourning the death of a loved one that they weren't able to be with or not have a service for. And all those folks out there across our country who are up in arms and protesting, not because they're saddened by the death of George Floyd, but because they are now finding something to do and it seems meaningful to them. It's a horrible loss many of us are affected with right now. So it's our duty as believers to share with other believers, especially those who are growing through a dry spell. Even Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthians when he, that he was encouraged by brothers and sisters in Christ and his spirit was refreshed. Of Titus, he said in 2 Corinthians that his spirit too was refreshed. And so many of you watching right now have been so supporting and encouraging to me and my family on my path to pastoral ministry these past 10 years, starting out as Deacon Dan, and then Vicar Dan, and then Pastor Dan, P. Dan, or even just Dan. My spirit has been refreshed over and over again by you. 
And we love the encouragement that continues to pour in each day, the cards, letters, emails, phone calls. Now we've got a counter in our office. We're going to have to figure out where else to put them because we're getting so many encouraging notes. So thank you for that. Friends, as you are filled by the Spirit and satisfied in Christ, you can overflow to those things around you, those people around you, in those places around you. So begin in your home. Then move out to neighbors, your coworkers, your schoolmates, and so on. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control should be flowing daily from husbands to wives and wives to husbands. From parents to children, from children to parents. And these qualities should be flowing between us Christians in this common Christian church, even if a fellow believer is sometimes difficult to be around. Friends, if you only come to church to get something for yourself, to get through that next week, you're going to be like the Dead Sea, all salt and no water. I think there's a picture of me, I mean, floating in the Dead Sea because you don't swim in the Dead Sea. The salt content is so high that you simply float. I'm there in, I don't know, eight feet of water maybe, just floating on top. The Dead Sea is so salty that nothing can live in it because rivers of fresh water are coming in, but nothing is going out. So when you come to the church, come with this prayer. When you come to this time of worship, whether it be here in this sanctuary or where you're at today, come with this prayer. Lord, fill me with your spirit and help it to flow out to others, to those who are thirsty. And then allow those rivers of the Holy Spirit to run out of you to those folks. And you'll discover that you're actually more satisfied after those rivers flow out than you were before. That's the key to prevent Christian burnout and really burnout in any area of life. Be satisfied in Christ. Let his fullness come into you and flow out to others. So, Pastor Neil would say there has to be a so what All this stuff, we're talking about Pentecost and what Jesus' words meant then and what they mean now. What does it mean for my life? What practical applications can I take to what you're saying today, Pastor Dan? Well, first, you need to honestly assess where you're at. Would you describe those rivers of living water as being there 10% of the time, 90% of the time, all the time, or maybe not at all? If those rivers of living water, if that doesn't describe you at all, then come to Jesus and drink. If you have to admit that your river is more like a trickle, then make it a priority in your life to be satisfied with the riches of Christ. And I know it sounds cliche, but the best ways to do those things, to invite Jesus into your heart, to mature your faith, are simply to pray, praise, and give thanks. Pray. Read your Bible. Study, do your daily devotions alone and with your family. Friends, walk in the Spirit and ask Him to fill you. And then get the focus off yourself and onto all those others who you can bless. Pray that your normal everyday experience would be that from your innermost being, rivers of water could flow out to a world that is so thirsty. Another thing Pastor Neil has said many times Christianity is more caught than taught. Don't keep it to yourself. Let what you know about your God and your Savior Jesus out to a world that so desperately needs to hear. Let it out to others and tell them why you have hope and who you have hope in. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will continue now with a few words of offering. Thank you, Pastor Dan, for those words. It's kind of fun seeing you float on the Dead Sea. I think I was there like 25 years ago, and I I think you were floating just as high as I was. You don't sink. You just don't sink in that. So, uh, Again, we thank you for those words of encouragement and looking at that Dead Sea analogy there that we pray that as the fresh water of God's love for us has come to us, as so 
eloquently was shared. We don't want it to stop. We don't want it to stop at the Dead Sea, but we want that fresh water to go out and fill the world. And you, my friends, help make that possible here at Zion. We are so blessed these past months of isolation and online only and technology as wonderful as it is, it's not quite the same as that interaction. And you're watching, your support, your prayers, your letters, your encouragement, all those things are wonderfully uh, appreciated and blessed. We get a chance to see it because you sent it to us, but I'm hoping you take an opportunity to share those same things with perhaps some other members of the congregation, maybe your neighborhood, those folks that need what you have. And we also thank you for your financial support. Uh, that's just been wonderful that it has continued, and we pray you do so because uh, all these expenses and stuff that goes with running an organization, a church, a group of fellow believers, they don't stop. So thank you so much. And the donations can be given online. Just you go to our website and click donate here to the link. Uh, and also you could bring your offering or mail it to us. Uh, however you would get that would be appreciated. Uh, several things going on that uh, would be helpful. One of the things, uh, here's an offering for you from our Early Childhood Center. I think you're aware that our Early Childhood Center has never closed. Uh, from the very beginning, it's remained open as one of the essential services that has been pointed out across our nation. And we're so grateful for the dedication of our Early Childhood Center staff under the leadership of Paula Hance. Uh, she has a note, a request actually. She's looking for a part-time individual to serve as a new office administrator, assistant, uh, office administration assistant. And the job would be doing data entry for the most part entering tuition, using the program Zeke has, entering receipts, entering timesheet hours, as well as other tasks. And apparently the job is part-time, but the intent is that it would be an ongoing, so it might be a, um, a second job for you or something along those lines. But if you are able and interested, please contact Paula Hance at our Early Childhood Center. We thank you for being supportive in all that we do. And at this time, we're looking forward to our offering song, which is Holy Spirit, and Lori Ebert will be singing it with the accompaniment of Bryce Peterson. <laughs>
Thank you, Lori and Bryce, for that sharing. Please join me now as we continue with our confession of our faith in that triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. O Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for being our God and we your people. And on this Pentecost celebration day, we thank you for the coming of the Holy Spirit who wonderfully creates faith through baptism and through our commitment to you that you have created faith in us, through his sustaining of that faith, through the sacrament of Holy Communion and the reading of the scriptures, encouraging us through fellowship with one another. We need your continued presence and presence and power in our life. Grant that to us, Lord, especially in these days that so many folks are beginning to dread. Please help us not to live in fear, let that dominate us, both in these pandemic days and especially in the most recent days where Twin Cities have become the epicenter of unrest and social discord, of protests, physical confrontation and harm, of property destruction. Oh Lord, we pray that you would grant healing to our community and land. Grant respect towards each other. Grant wisdom to all involved in these most recently unsettling days so that the love and concern demonstrated for all people that you have through Jesus can be demonstrated and practiced in our communities here and across our land in these difficult days and continuing long after. We pray, Lord, that you would provide your continued blessing on all of our loved ones. We think about the celebrations that are taking place for the 50th wedding anniversary of Padre and Madre Krenke and for the birthday of Bonnie Sheldon, our office administrator. She's not telling us how many years, but we wish her a happy birthday anyway. We pray that you would be with those families that are dealing with health concerns, not just the COVID virus, but even more so. We're so grateful that it's not impacting a lot of folks, but it is impacting many others. So all of us that are dealing with health concerns and kneeling of, needing your healing and strength, we pray for. For Chris Ruggiero, Jim Wagner, Anita Olson, Tamaya Hassing, Rob Wilson, Kathy Koble, Kathleen Jensen, Randall Stack, Orville McEnthune, Diane Smith, Lisa Paulson, Rick Shorten, Nicole Jenedick, John Liu, Andy Nelson, Karen Dorweiler, Beth Scanlon, Isabel Kloss, Phyllis Olson, Teresa Sundstrom, Cindy Stover, Linda Johnson, Marion Grohn, Krista Buha, Pastor Bill Crimsey, and Gerald, fiance of Marilyn, our assistant director of Zeke. A long list, Lord, and these are ones we're aware of. But for these folks and for all folks that are dealing with health concerns and the fears that accompany it, grant your healing, your wholeness, and your health to them. And we pray also for 
those families who have experienced death. Again, a long list, none of them COVID related, but nonetheless very real as they've departed this life and because of their faith in Jesus, the Christians are with you. So we pray for the family of Judy Miller, the family of Louis Nelson, the family of Naomi Buddha, aunt of Joan Gilmore, the family of Omokindi Olakinai, Mark Reddick's son-in-law's mother, the family of Nancy Bershaw, cousin of Mark Reddick. A lot of sorrow represented their Lord and yet a lot of joy in the long term for eternal life because of Jesus. And for our five families whom we highlight this week, for Brenda Walstead, Sue Webert, Martin and Marilyn Weevil Sr., Sam Wells, Rachel Kamen, Amber, Jasmine, Isla, Werner. What special people, Lord, and we pray that they would experience and enjoy your continued blessings and presence this day and the days to come. All these many things, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus, the same Jesus who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Inviting you to join us in our closing hymn, hymn number 913, O Holy Spirit, Enter In. <laughs>